Hello and welcome. I am Laura Toner Haddock, the co-producing artistic director of Austin Playhouse. And y'all, it is my great pleasure to be with you here today. And we are going to be talking about, um, we're not going to be talking about theater at all. We are going to be talking about gardening. Um, because as it turns out that within the theater community, we have some incredible folks and they're going to be joining us today. We'll bring them on here in just a second. And they're going to share their tips and their tricks uh, for their fall and winter gardens, because it's apparently that time where we want to we want to start building them. And uh, we have the chat going, so you'll have a chance to throw any questions over there. Um, and we really, this is part of Austin Playhouse's series on building community and the kind of the community impact that uh, that gardening, that this closer relationship to the food chain can have on our lives. And I think we have a lot of uh, three folks with us today who have um, really explored that during, during the past 18 months of this pandemic. And I'm very, very excited to have them all here with us. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to bring up um, I'm going to bring up uh, Austin Playhouse acting company member Claire Grasso is with us from her garden on, <laughs> on location in her backyard. Welcome, there. Welcome Claire. Uh, we also have Jennifer Rose Davis, who is an incredible hey, customer, everybody. and you can see her in her office with everything organized. And Jennifer um, also has has a garden that that I think attracts more wildlife than I've ever seen out there. Jennifer sent in videos and there are rabbits and butterflies and just all, all the things are, are there frolicking in her garden. And then we also have with us um, Deja Morgan, who's another actor and theater administrator extraordinaire. Um, and she has been involved in, is this right if I say it's a community gardening initiatives up in Philadelphia? Yeah. Uh, really, I've really enjoyed following her journey. Uh, so I'm it's I'm so excited to have all of y'all here with us today. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, so that's 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 my introduction. And now I would love for y'all to introduce yourselves and and just let us know whatever you would like about um, about the gardening's impact on on your on your worlds. Um, Claire, you want to kick us off there? Sure. So I've been, um, I've been gardening almost all my life. And even when I moved to apartments, I always had like little boxes or something on my balcony um, of herbs or things like that. Cause I've always loved to grow things. Um, and when COVID hit our yard and our, our house became like our whole world, our everything. And so I really wanted to, I had more time on my hands, I guess. I had just had a baby, but. Right. Um, <laughs> well, I had a baby at the start of COVID, y'all. In in March 2020, you just, you kicked off the pandemic. Um, right with, off with a yeah. child. And then, and then built this amazing gardening haven there. But so. we, <laughs> we wanted this, you know, there were all those supply line problems early in the pandemic. And that kind of made me feel like, you know, I should, I should be um, working more towards like building um, some sustainability for my own family uh, so that we have some self-sufficiency. And then I want to make sure that my neighbors are taken care of too. And so I started combing local Facebook groups, uh, the Buy Nothing group in particular. Um, people gifted us dirt. They gifted us um, cinder blocks to border out garden beds. I got cedar fence pickets from a woman. Um, so this garden really was expanded by my community from what I had had before. And now we're able to share seeds and I shared a lot of okra this year <laughs> um, and, and stuff with my neighbors. And, and so it's also been a place, it's been a haven for us during COVID, a safe and like thriving and growing and beautiful place that reminds me that, you know, humans can give really great things to the earth too. <laughs> and then um, it's also been a way of building relationships with my neighbors and taking care of my neighbors and having my yard take care of us. So that's kind of been my journey. That's awesome. Um, Jennifer, how about how about you? Yeah. Um, well, I never gardened when I was young. And I um, started really gardening when I when we moved into this house uh, about uh, 10 years ago. And um, I was never very good at it. You know, I would get them some things to grow, but I 
I would really struggle and not really know why things would grow or why. This is where I am. <laughs> I want to know how you got from there to where you are now. <laughs> right. Well, so what happened basically was last uh, 2019 was an incredibly busy year for me. I did two of the biggest theater shows that I've ever done back to back. And my garden suffered. I mean, it completely got overgrown with Bermuda grass. You literally could not even see the beds. And so I knew that I wanted to reclaim my garden as part of this, of 2020, right? And then we had snowpocalypse. And it was terrifying. And my neighbors were struggling for food, they were struggling for heat, and I was up on buy nothing groups trying to basically keep people alive. And that gave me this huge impetus to say, I want my life to be more self-sustainable. I want to be able to take care of my family. I want to be able to take care of other people. I really need to get this garden going, get it producing, and actually be able to make use of these things and give to others. And so the other thing that happened during and just after Snowpocalypse actually was that I found um, this wonderful show called Big Dreams, Small Spaces with Monty Don. And Monty Don is this um, presenter that does all these gardening shows in England. He also does a show called Gardener's World. And he's a fantastic gardener, you know, with this immense garden. He's been doing this for like, you know, 30 years. And he's just wonderful to watch. And he's so encouraging that you watch him and you think, I can do this. I can learn about this stuff. I can make this happen. Oh, if I don't do it right, I just pull it up and put it somewhere else, you know? And it was this incredibly empowering um, thing to give me courage to go, you know, on the internet and learn about plants and figure out what plants want. Because that's the part that I never got, right? I would just put things down wherever you know, I wanted to put them. And I didn't think about, well, is it going to get enough light? And is it going to get enough water? And, you know, what kind of soil is it? And so this 2020 really was learning about what do plants want? What kind of soils do they like? How do you fix your soil if you have bad soil? And um, it was, it, and also just a huge amount of hand digging to actually get my garden back into a place where I could grow. And then this year has really been growing and living and starting to really be productive. And me just learning a ton more about plants and about um, pests and about fertilizing and all these things that, you know, when you're kind of in, in it loosely, you don't really get. So that's been my journey in the last couple of years. That's wonderful. And I, I, yeah, and Claire, Claire, um, Claire and I did a show together this summer in the, the brief amount of time where we could do, do a show this summer. Um, and, and, uh, and she would bring in the literal fruits from her garden to, to rehearsal. And so there were eggplant and okra and tomatoes. And, and I, you know, everyone in the cast would just take things home <laughs> at the end of the night. And um, it was, it was beautiful. We we're very grateful for that. Um, for that, we we went out afterwards one night, and there had been a big thing of okra. You weren't, you weren't there, but we went across the street. There's an outdoor um, bar across the street from where we were rehearsing, and there was a thing of raw okra on the table from Claire's garden. People were just eating raw okra. They were just, <laughs> That's just awesome. going into it. Um, anyway, and Deja, tell us tell us about your journey. It... Yeah, my. Um, I will say eating raw okra, like especially like picked off the plant is like the best. And I did that for the first time like a couple weeks ago and I will never be the same. I'm like forever changed from that experience. So, yeah. <laughs> um, but my, I think entryway into gardening feels similar to like wanting to use it as a means of like taking care of my community and a way of like living more like self in a more self-sustaining way. Um, I gardened a little bit with my papa when I was younger, but like I didn't really think anything of it until the pandemic happened last year. And there were just a lot of like mutual aid groups popping up where there were like a lot of people in Philly that like didn't have access to food. And there were like the like free lunch programs had like stopped. So there were like kids that didn't have food. And like I, um, the new community that I was like, 
building there were like young people who were like, okay, cool. Like what resources do we have to like help these people meet their basic needs? And so like, it just really made me think about how like, we do not have our basic needs met and like having food is something that we should have. I don't feel like, I don't believe we should pay for food. <laughs> like the earth provides enough for us to have more than what we need. And like, yeah. So anyway, um, I hopped into these like mutual aid initiatives and there was this one um, mutual aid initiative called Bunny Hop and they partner with the farm um, and they got CSA boxes and they would like deliver it to neighbors all across Philly for free. Um, so like that summer, last summer, I like kind of sat down with my roommate at the time and we like did a huge like manifestation under like the full moon. I was like, I want to learn how to farm. I want to learn how to like build my own garden and and grow food and like um i want to learn how to like cook under someone and so i feel like those things have kind of like blossomed since then and i volunteered at this farm and that was the first time that i like got my hands in the dirt but i remember the first day that i went out there i didn't know what to expect but the first thing i did was smush bugs i smushed like the <laughs> Well, we I, put a box. <laughs> they were like Harlequin bugs that are on. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, I'm like, oh, like, I don't bugs. But I, when I got out there, I was like, okay, we're just, there's bugs on my hand now. But I remember <laughs> we were like at the end of the day and we were like planting, we had to plant like sweet potatoes or something. And it started raining. And like, I don't know, it was just the experience of just like the rain, like, falling down on me like I didn't care that I was getting wet up and we were just like putting our hands in the dirt and like planting the seeds and like that for me felt like just like a turning point where I was like this is where I want to be like th this is the kind of thing that I want to do um because like one seed like from a bell pepper like you plant that one seed and like you can have so many, like you have so many fruits that come from that seed that can feed your whole block or your whole neighborhood. And like the resources that the earth gives us is just so abundant. And I just want to like, I think gardening for me and having that experience of like farming and like um, getting to like provide neighbors with food from farms, like it just made me want change my relationship with the land because I think sometimes they're like we view growing as like oh yeah we just expect food to pop up and things to grow and like obviously we look for things like weather and the you know whatever but there's a deeper relationship that like we once had with the land that I don't feel like we have as much anymore because of capitalism and so I feel like me getting into like gardening and cooking and like wanting to build a more self-sustaining life directly ties into like redefining my relationship with the land, moving away from capitalism, finding ways of taking care of my community and myself. Um, and really it's just tools for liberation. Like it's truly how we gain more autonomy and not have to rely on systems that are not taking care of us. Um, so yeah, that was kind of like my turning point. And I got a seed keeping fellowship at the beginning of the year, which has totally just like transformed my view of like, just how we preserve cultures and our lineage. Um, and yes. Have you read, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but have no. you read Michael Twitty's book? He's a Cooking. chef. Michael What's that? Cooking Gene? Not the Cooking Gene. He has another one that's about okra. And you had posted something on social media about how okra came over during the transatlantic. Yeah. Uh, with the seeds braided into these kidnapped people's hair. And mm -hmm. um, he has this book about okra and about just how like sacred and crazy cool that uh, that food source, that staple. Yes. Is. Uh, I, th I thought immediately thought of you when I was looking at it. I was like, she would uh -huh. love it. <laughs> yes. No, I love Michael Twitty and I yeah. teach a cooking class right now. And he's who I like teach, like all the recipes that we have are like straight from his books, but I haven't read that book, but I'm definitely going to add it to my collection. So yes, it's so good. good. You would love it. Yeah. We'll throw, we'll throw the, our references into the, the comments later on. And Kim, that's, that's awesome. Um, ah, I love, I love all of these stories. Um, I'm going to, 
Should we do? Let's look at, I'm going to, I'm going to jump over to the chat and see if we don't have anything up there. There Again, our chat is open if you're checking us out on YouTube and you have something. Um, if you have a question, feel free to throw it in there now and we can get to it. Or if anybody says anything at any time that sparks a question, you can throw that on in. Um, let's, let's see how these, how this video works. This is, um, Deja, this is some pictures of your farming experience. Um, so you can... That is my moringa tree. That's oh, moringa. fried okra. Those are my black eyed peas that are, yeah, that's bitter melon seeds. That's the bitter melon that's ready to be seeded. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and tell us, and this again, I'll put this in the comments. So what is it you're 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 working as a what are you working on right now? What is what is the um, thing? so that those pictures are specifically from my seed keeping fellowship. So um, there's like a cohort of us that are growing seeds that are specific to our cultural heritage. So I'm growing foods from like my Filipino heritage and uh, also my like black Southern heritage. So like I, the bitter melon is like a staple food that like my great grandmother used to cook. And like, I actually hated that food when I was younger cause it was so like, it's bitter. And it wasn't appealing to me, but as I'm like older and I'm like, oh, this has medicinal, like it's a great medicinal food. And um, the bitter melon is actually green when you're supposed to eat it, but it turns like that bright orange color when it's ready to be seeded. And when you like break it open, the seeds are in these like red gelatinous sacks that look like cherries. And the seed, the brown seeds that you saw are what they actually look like. And you have to go through like a process of fermentation to get the like sacks off. So that's what I've been learning through my like seed keeping fellowship is like how to process seeds. What kind of seeds? Are they wet seeds? Are they dry seeds? Um, but also I think something important that I've learned from like the seed keeping fellowship is like one, just how unfortunately like evil corporations are had that have like stripped cultures of like their native seeds that they've been carrying for like centuries in order to like yeah but i think like i watched this documentary with my seed keeping fellowship and it really opened my eyes to how important seed keeping is because it, literally you're keeping seeds that are able to like adapt through like climate change and that's important because like when we have droughts or when we flood, like we need seeds that can withstand those changes so that we can continue to have food. And when cultures are like, unfortunately like exploited and their seeds are taken from them, then we as a people, like <laughs> it takes away from our ability to survive. So I'm like really grateful that I'm able to like learn how to seed keep. And it's making me like, like my papa has a huge compost pile and like, He'll throw food out there and like we had a squash, like squash was growing. We had pineapples and like onions and every time it sees, I'm like, save those seeds because like <laughs> we can keep those and like keep growing them and hopefully they'll like adapt and like that can be a part of our like family tradition that we have these seeds in our family. So that's something that I've been learning about and it's just, I've just learned so much that I had no clue about literally six months ago. So, um, yeah, um, those are all my little plant babies that I've been nurturing this whole year. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to learn about some winter gardening. Okay, so, all right, yeah. all right. We'll we'll <laughs> we'll take it from this macro level of saving the planet through seed keeping. But I will say, I <laughs> I and get a little more micro into our winter gardening. Excellent, excellent segue there, Deja. Um, <laughs> but uh, we. I will. I do want to throw. In, I I I was born in Mississippi, I have relatives, and I've eaten a lot of okra, and I love it, um, and I'm grateful for its presence in this country, but not how I got here. <laughs> um, but uh, I took for granted that all the things I grew up eating on my great uncle's farm would always be around. But there's a fig I I can't get. I don't know if it exists anymore. I don't know if, you know, if, if, but there, there are things that I ate growing up that are just not around anymore because it was a couple mm -hmm. generations ago and it's not what is being sold in the stores. It's not what seeds are being kept. Um, 
<laughs> we have a so another winter gardening segue. We have a question um, in other chat. Well, let's 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 talk about this. When you're planning your gardens, Claire, Jennifer, Deja, if you if you you may have like a small plot back in Philly eventually, but when you're planning, um, now Austin terrifies me climate wise because we just if things get so hot and they get hot late in the year, we can have fifth summer in the middle of October, and you're like, what are y'all planting planning to plant next? Um, in so this is my favorite season to plant in Texas um, because it is milder than the summers, which get really hot and can stress your plants. And then you're battling bugs because your plants are stressed and that's going to bring those. And um, for fall, I really look forward to the root vegetables and the brassicas, which are your things like um, Brussels sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower, cabbages. There's also a nice window where if it is warm, it's not so big of a deal where you can grow like radishes and peas. Peas do great, by the way. If you're like, I can't grow peas, they always die in my garden, plant them in the fall. That's, you're gonna have better luck. Um, so that's what I'm looking for. Like lettuces, peas, um, radishes, carrots, little gardeny things. And I'm gonna show everyone your garden now, Claire, and you can kind of talk us Claire, you've been, you're muted while this video has been playing. So we'll have you talk again. It's a whole thing. <laughs> Everybody just enjoy Claire's garden for a second. I can't, I can't unmute you. I don't know. It's exciting. <laughs> so, but look at this and you can see what she was talking about, the cinder blocks that her, um, that the Buy Nothing group gave and the sticks. And I also love Claire and Jennifer both have this. I'll just comment in their garden, some gorgeous flowers also it's not you know and i love that balance um because i've seen the bouquets on your tables in addition to the flowers there's now claire now claire you can share what it's actually hugely <laughs> important so what i was kind of saying was you know you can see some of the materials that were gifted to me old palettes and things that um came from our buy nothing group um it was hugely important to me to also have um pollinators come because that's going to make your garden more productive and there are a lot of flowers that not only bring pollinators and uh, good wildlife, good ecosystem participants into your garden, they do, they make it beautiful and uh, they uh, can repel bugs. I have Cracker Jack marigolds planted next to tomatoes and squashes to keep bugs away. Um, I have calendula, which is one of my favorite things to plant and you can plant it in the fall and the winter. It's called a pot marigold, but it's not actually a marigold. It's, I, I don't know what species of thing it is, but it's, um, it's a beautiful flower. You can use it in teas um, and it prevents asp asparagus beetles and other different types of pests that come after stuff. So I did some reading on like, you know, I've always had small spaces. This is the biggest space I've ever had. Um, but I always wanted to produce a lot because I want some to share, <laughs> some for me. Um, and then some for the wildlife. Um, and so I just did a lot of reading about what plants well next to other things. I've got thyme growing next to my strawberries because that helps the strawberries. They have kind of symbiotic relationships. Jennifer gave me some um, mycelium from the Austin Mycological Society uh, to grow mushrooms. And she's had way better luck with growing the mushrooms than I have, but um, they, they have just like contributed to the richness of the soil they just help the plants uh, grow and produce more. And I do less because anywhere in your garden where you see a weed <laughs> is somewhere that a plant that you wanted could have grown. So like my garden looks crazy when it's really filled out, but actually I do very little weeding because I have flowers growing here. I have herbs growing here. I have lettuce growing in the shade under these things that love the light and the heat and stuff like that. And you can really maximize space, especially in the winter with root vegetables like carrots and parsnips and radishes, which are really quick to grow and easy to grow. Um, highly recommend planting those alongside your larger items like collards or um, 
tomatoes, even if you've still got tomatoes, a lot of people like to grow tomatoes in the fall here. Um, you can plant. Okay. Cool things. Take me back to the very beginning. Assume I know nothing. Assume I buy a lot of plants in little pots, little seedlings at like, for example, my elementary child's gardening fair where they're like, come and have all of these plants and Gray and I, my husband, will <laughs> get them and we'll bring them home with the best of intentions. And a little while later, we've just, anyway, it's sad. It's very sad. So like soil, are you raised garden bed people? Are you in the ground people? What is the benefit of whatever you do? Um, I have been both. We actually, um, well, you haven't actually showed my garden yet, but um, when let's we first let's, garden, show, okay. let's show your garden. <laughs> We'll do that. We'll do Jennifer's garden. Mm, I love that. And we can hear you, Jennifer. I don't know what you Oh, okay, great. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so this is my garden. And uh, as you're seeing it now, which is this year, um, we've actually taken these stone beds and raised them. These are our yard bunnies. We have yard bunnies. Um, but when we first put them in, they were actually, uh, they were in ground beds. And this year we raised them up to be able to put better soil in them um, because our soil is very clay here in Austin. That's the biggest struggle that most people have mm -hmm. with growing things in Austin is that the Austin soil is very thick, very heavy, very clumpy, and it's very alkaline. And this is something that I learned this year is that different plants prefer a different pH to their soil. So some plants really like acid soil. Some plants really like alkaline soil. If you're growing in Austin, 90% of the time, you're gonna have very alkaline soil. So if you wanna set up a fall garden bed and you're starting from nothing, the first thing to do is, you know, figure out where you're gonna put it, take out all the weeds and everything that's growing there now, and then go get a huge, as much compost as you can afford and dig up your soil and mix that compost into it. Yeah. Because the best way you can ever improve soil is to mix a lot of organic matter into it. Compost and vermiculite, if you can get your hands on some of that, that's worm castings. And I'm I'm ridiculous. Like I go through the green belt near my house and like scoop up little worm castings that I see in the dirt on the ground in my neighborhood. So I'm fully crazy. But if you can mix some of that stuff <laughs> up into your soil, it's also it's full of like nutrients and and we, it's just really you can charge. We can have some um, so vermiculi. Uh, so what <laughs> vermiculite is, if you haven't used it before, it's actually a mineral, and I think it comes from volcanic activity. But what it does is it helps the soil retain water. And so in Texas, if your soil is retaining water, your plants are going to get more water. Um, the other thing that I really learned about this year, which can really help your plants grow, is to incorporate... Um, uh, basically mushrooms into your garden. There's a special kind of mushroom called, um, help me, Claire. You know what it is, don't you? Oh, do I? Uh, we, uh, can always, we can always think of it later. Yeah. If we... anyway, You're my mushroom kind. friend. You're the one that brought me into that knowledge. Kind of, uh, <laughs> well, there's a special kind of fungi that actually grows in your soil. And what it does is it helps the roots of your plants connect with the water in your soil and the beneficial organisms that grow into your soil and it helps them grow bigger. And so if you look, um, uh, oh, it's called mycorrhizal fungi. Yes. Um, and so a lot of organic fertilizers and some organic soils that you get will say with mycorrhizal fungi. And so this year when I started adding stuff to my soil, I, I'm adding a bunch of compost and I'm adding, um, I'm adding fertilizer with this mycorrhizal fungi because I found that last year, the plants where I dropped a little of that fertilizer in with the plant when I was planting it, they double, they were double the size of the other plants. Wow. I'm going to want you to pause for just a second. I think Deja is going to need to be leaving us pretty soon. Um, so I just wanted to thank her for being with us today. Um, yeah. Fascinating I conversation. We could talk much longer about all the things. Yeah, I'm gonna have to replay the rest of this because I'm very like interested in like, because mm -hmm. just when it's, I mean, it's not real. I, I'm assuming that most people that are watching this are in Texas, but in Philly, like 
most of everything is the soil there is like lead. So there's like rare, do you see like people growing in the actual soil because it, it's like an old city. There's a lot of, oh, the right. So everybody you has to be raised back. Yeah. But also I learned that if you plant sunflowers, sunflowers are like a good plant that will actually absorb the lead in the soil. And then you just have to keep soil testing. But I think it's good in general just to test your soil before you like plant in ground just because you just never know what is in it. But I didn't know that Austin was like had a lot of clay type soil so that's good to know you just hit rock you can't dig it up you're just like high rocks and hard <laughs> things well yeah I, now I know. scatter now a I... seed and a prayer <laughs> good luck friend <laughs> I, well thank y'all so much for having me and thank you I'm, Deja. I'm definitely thank gonna you. hit y'all up when i get my garden stuff together to be like okay what are these tips? Because I sound like a novice. <laughs> I'm going to ask you about seed saving questions because I just started that process this year. I just started saving seeds and I love it. Please, please. Yes. Well, thank you, Laura, for having me. Thank and you. I will see y'all out in the gardening world. All right. Bye. 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 Um, all right. So now we are we are here with, with Claire and Jennifer. So we were going over soil and that... I know it feels elementary in step one, but um, as I mentioned, I grew up in, I, I didn't grow up, but I, you know, was born in Mississippi and spent a lot of time there and their soil is really good for dropping a seed in and growing things. And so it, it's kind of centuries. taken a long time for me to realize, hey, it's just not going to be successful if you try that mm -hmm. same method here. We have to um, have to adjust. And so we're looking at putting in some raised garden beds and, yeah. um, I think for, so you kind of gave us this very hypothetical scenario where you have gotten plants from like a kid's gardening. Totally fair. hypothetical. Totally. And yeah. Just, um, <laughs> October and, 2nd and 3rd is our new <laughs> fall gardening time. I think for somebody who's like, okay, I, I just have a small space. I want to grow as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't really know where to start. I think a raised garden is the way to go. You're going to have a lot less of a learning curve. You're not going to have to sit there with your soil. Invest in good soil that you buy at a store. Um, you yeah, know, and you most times when you, when you want to put down, uh, when you want to put soil in a raised bed, think of it as I'm going to get half soil, half compost. And that's yeah. going to be what I put in my raised bed. And, you know, Claire actually turned me on to this wonderful um, soil, which is what she got in her garden that they just sell as 50 50 soil and compost from uh austin uh austin landscaping supply mm -hmm. they're right uh, anyway we can put a link in the in the chat but when i when i started last year i got what was quote unquote raised bed garden soil from a different local landscaping company and it was terrible soil it was you know it had no nutrients in it it didn't clump when you like you want this rich black soil that when you pick it up and squeeze it it makes a little nice clump that then kind of falls apart. It, it You want soil that makes it yeah. feel like it's moist all the time. Yeah, right? That's how you tell <laughs> it's good soil. You don't want stuff that's already like rock hard or is so sandy that it, you know, feels like the beach. You want this rich stuff. Like if you've ever opened a bag of potting soil, that's what you want your soil to look like. And um, another so. hugely important component and one that it took me so my garden used to be on the other side of my yard and then we kind of expanded by putting another bed in the fall because we wanted to grow more fall stuff. We always have better luck in the fall, knock on wood. Um, we put an in-ground bed on the opposite side and I realized as I was watching these two beds produce over the course of the season, I get much better light on this side of the yard and I never really registered that. It was all just trial and error, but the light is hugely important. So you want good soil and then you need your vegetables and fruits especially need uh, usually like eight hours of sunlight. And in the winter, that's harder to get. So you want to make sure that they are like really in a spot in your yard that gets the most sun during the day, doesn't have a lot of shade. I got lucky because um, you also have to think about the changing of the seasons. Right now, I get a lot of shade in this garden in the evenings, which is great because it's 100 degrees in the evenings and my plants can't withstand that. Once all these leaves fall off these trees, I actually get a ton of sunlight here in the winter. So what I always thought of as the shadiest part in my yard actually isn't in the winter because all the leaves go away. Mm -hmm. so you kind of want to think about like, how does your yard change over the course of the season? Where are you getting the most shade in the winter time or in the fall as the days get shorter? 
and really plant your stuff in a space where they're going to get a lot of sunlight. Yeah. So um, this year when I started, I actually found a little, uh, it's like a little meter that it has three settings. It reads um, the pH of your soil. Uh, if you leave it in a bed for a while, it'll tell you how much light you get. And it'll also tell you how moist your soil is. And so it's got three different abilities to, to tell you about what your soil is doing. And I just found it on Amazon. And it has been the most useful thing because um, if you research what you're going to plant, which is, that's the one thing that I've learned this year is if you want to plant something, read about the plant online and find out what it likes. What kind of soil does it like? How much water does it like? What is it like to be planted? And what is it like to be planted next to? You know, my most frequent Google search is what can I plant near tomatoes? You know, um, things like that. And when you learn about those things, then you have a much better chance of success when you actually plant things out because you're giving the plants what they want. You know, it's like taking care of an animal or a child. You have to learn what it wants so you can give it to it. So I, so I have to take care of the plants and. <laughs> so that right. the, third, the third component besides good soil, good sunlight is good watering. And mm -hmm. you can turn um, a joyful experience into a dreadful experience really quickly by not thinking about how you're going to get water to your garden. We used to hand water everything, which sucked because it's huge. It takes forever. Yeah. If you are, and it wastes a lot of water, actually. Um, if you are planning on you know, a decent sized bed, anything that's like three foot by four foot, I would highly recommend. I just got cheap hoses from, um, they're like little drip hoses that I think I got at Lowe's. It was like a $20 um, set for mm -hmm. 200 square feet or something. So most people don't need that much, but um, setting it on a timer or um, turning it on at night and letting it drip deeply for a while so that you're not out there doing that yourself is you're going to yeah. water your plants better, more efficiently, and they're going to grow better and you're not going to hate it. You're actually going to enjoy the experience. <laughs> yeah. I can't recommend enough. Um, you can, you can do it with soaker hoses, which are um, very easy to use. You just buy a little timer at a hardware store, buy a couple of soaker hoses, put it around your gardens, hook it up to the timer, hook it up to the water spout and you have it water. Like I, I you water it about every like other day. You don't have to have a fancy irrigation system you designed don't have by the landscape architects. You I mean, just you can, but you don't have to start that way. Uh -huh. You can just start with something that saves you time and energy. You know, if you only have like a few pots on your patio, you can hand water those. But, you know, when I hand water my garden, it takes me like an hour and a half. It's ridiculous. <laughs> we have um, a, a playwright in the chat, one of my favorite playwrights talking about, uh, what does your plant want? The dramaturgy of gardening. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> which, is, which is the theater tie-in I've been looking for here. <laughs> Who are their friends? What are their We're friends? all looking for our motivation, <laughs> whether it's the plants or the garden. And I also, I, I mean, I, I find it aesthetically really, really pleasing to have multiple plants and the different levels and all of that. But what I'm really hearing is that it can just help your garden a lot to figure out who wants to be friends and how we want to get for um, from critters to, you know, not having to weed as much to just mm -hmm. helping those, those plants um, get the soil, get the nutrients that they, they want to thrive. That's right. I mean, once you, once you learn about what a plant wants, you can kind of create uh, little microclimates in your garden. You can say, okay, so these plants all like shade. So mm -hmm. let's make a little place where you kind of get some shade from this tree that I have that I can't do anything with. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll grow my lettuces in the shade in the summer when it's too hot for them to grow anywhere else. You know, so like in my garden, I have, um, I have most of the beds on my side yard. And we actually, in the summer, we actually bought a little sunshade that was very inexpensive that we just put up over it when the temperatures go above 95. Because at, at when it gets really hot in the summer, a lot of things like tomatoes and peppers won't set fruit. Yeah. Um, and so I just put that sunshade up when it goes up about 95. But then I have one bed that gets full sun. And that's where I put the things like the okra and stuff like that, that really want all that sunlight. So, and this is a thing that I've struggled with in, in my, my limited gardening experience. Like I had a basil plant and it was swarmed with 
little roly polies, little pill bugs. Mm -hmm. um, Buffy is in the chat asking about how do you deal with Texas bugs? Um, and I just found, you know, almost anything I bring in instantly, the, um, what are the ones that the little, that make the white lines on the leaves that. Oh, like, um, leaf borers. Leaf yeah. Borers, yeah. Yeah. Just make me angry that I know there's something in there attacking my plants. And so what have y'all found is the most successful for just dealing with your general garden pests? Um, companion planting has helped me a lot. So you, when Jennifer talks about finding out what a plant wants, um, some of the things that you'll like want to look up is like, okay, so this bug really loves this plant. What is a trap crop? Like, I know we're supposed to be talking about fall gardens here, um, but yeah, like I planted a bunch of tomatoes. Can you explain what a trap crop is for people yes. who don't know? So I planted a bunch of tomatoes. In Texas, if you've ever grown a tomato, you know leaf-footed bugs come and just swarm and, and eat your fruit before you can get to it, and then your tomatoes are all dry and pasty and mealy and gross. I kind of, by accident, realized that they love sunflowers, and sunflowers are beautiful and they're easy to grow. So I planted sunflowers real close to my tomatoes. They grew up way big, so they provided shade for some other things that needed uh, cooler climate, like my asparagus that's kind of next to them. Those stink bug, little leaf footed bugs, like just went to town on those sunflowers. And I got tomatoes way longer in the season. Now, of course, everything's all heat stressed and crazy, but, but I got tomatoes for way longer in the season because they were all going to the trap crop. That is the thing that I planted to be beautiful, to bring pollinators but it wasn't necessarily the thing that I was like, ah, oh, I really want to eat those sunflower seeds, you know? I mean, they are good, but mm -hmm. but I planted stuff that I knew that would attract the bugs um, so that I could have the things that I didn't want to share with the bugs. Yeah, so that's been really helpful for me also. So basically my garden consists of mostly like um, these four by eight beds. And what I do is in the corner of the four by eight beds, I plant things like marigolds, which help keep away bugs. I plant little um, onions or chives, which help keep away bugs. Um, nasturtiums if I'm, are great. You have beautiful nasturtiums. nasturtiums. I put nasturtiums in. Um, also, if I'm planting potatoes, I learned um, just this year that if you plant petunias in with potatoes, it helps keep away potato blight. Um, so basically, I just plan to, wherever I'm going to have a bed, I just plan to have those little... Um, companion flowers that help keep bugs away. The other thing that has been the most helpful for me this year with keeping bugs um, away is um, uh, uh, Bacillium thurigenesis. Yeah. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Uh, in gardeners call it BT. And what it is, it's this natural occurring uh, bacteria and it's what they use to make mosquito dunks. There's a couple of different kinds of it. There's one that's specific to mosquitoes and gnats, and it's what they use to make mosquito dunks or mosquito bits. And there's another one that's called BTK that's specific about keeping off caterpillars, keeping off bugs. And what happens is if you spray it on your plants, um, the uh, caterpillars which try to bite your plants, they get some of this bacteria in them and they die. But it's completely non-harmful to people, to pets. I mean, you can literally, take your thing out, rinse it off and eat it, no problems. Yeah. And so basically I, I got some of this BT and you can buy it on Lowe's, you can buy it on Amazon, you can get it from any place that does gardening basically, because it's one of the best tools in the natural gardeners, in the organic gardeners uh, toolkit. And I basically spray it once a week, you know, got a little sprayer, mix it up once a week, spray it and it keeps pretty much 90% of the caterpillars and the bugs away. Um, the other tool that's really, really helpful is called neem oil. It's N-E-E-M. And um, you can actually, um, you can use that as well as a spray and the stuff that the BT doesn't get, the neem oil gets. Um, but with both of these things, if you're, if you're in a heat situation where it's getting really hot during the day, you either want to spray them really, really early in the morning or really, really uh, late in the evening, the night before, because you don't want to put them on in the heat of the day so that the sun reflects off the leaves of your plants and burns them. Okay. 
Um, I have some neem oil. I bought it when I had the leaf borer issue. Uh, we have we have a tomato question, and man, I will I will talk tomatoes all day. This is this is my thing. If I could grow one item well, it would be tomatoes because I love them and I miss tomatoes that taste like tomatoes. Yeah. I feel that mm -hmm. it's so infrequent that I actually get a tomato that has that. Anyway. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on from my from my tomato love. But um, Colin in the chat is asking, says she has had tomato plants this year. The heirloom variety got really big and beautiful, but didn't produce any fruit. The other two hybrid varieties produced a little. Suggestions for next year? Um, you want to take this or you want? Uh, whichever. Okay. <laughs> um, so my big secret to actually producing um, fruits on tomatoes and flowers and other um, fruiting plants is that you need to get a, um, there's different kinds of fertilizers, right? So uh, fertilizers can have like uh, a lot of nitrogen in them or they can have a lot of potassium in them. Uh, and there's, whenever you see a fertilizer that you buy, you'll see these three little numbers, right? The first number is nitrogen. The second number is potassium. I can't remember what the third one is. I can't either. Um, um, but so if you if you use uh, fertilizers that have a high first number, you're putting a lot of nitrogen in the soil. Nitrogen wants to grow green leaves and vines, right? So if you've got little plants like baby plants and you want them to grow big, you put nitrogen in. When you want plants to fruit or flower, you put potassium in. My biggest trick for growing tomatoes is to use Hosta Grow fertilizer. It's a seaweed-based fertilizer. You can get it at Lowe's, I believe, probably at Home Depot, too. H-A-S-T-A. Yeah, it's like Hasta La Vista, uh, but it's Hasta Grow. Um, and it, uh, I mean, a huge difference when I started using that to get my, uh, uh, my both my flowers and my fruits. You know, if I use that, I get a lot more. I, it's like double the production. So that's, that's basically what variety. I was going to say, is it sounds like... Um, our writer has great nitrogen rich soil. She needs more potassium. Um, I often will like use a little bit of bone meal and I would say mm -hmm. bone meal or yeah, bone meal is especially good for root vegetables. If you're growing in uh, the fall, any kind of beets or carrots or parsnips or rutabagas or any of those root vegetables, um, about a week before I plant any of those seeds, I kind of trowel in um, some bone meal because bone meal really helps uh, mm -hmm. set fruit, grow root vegetables, things like that. Um, also, I would say you're probably getting, um, tomatoes need lots of sun, but they also can't get too hot because yeah. when they get too hot, like you said, above 95, um, they can't pollinate effectively. Like they, they just won't set fruit if it's above a certain number. So if you're noticing that your plants look healthy and great, but they're not setting any fruit, you might want to shade them a little bit or just give them give them a little relief from the heat. Um, that will also help. Okay. Um, so, sorry. Sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so the other thing that I really learned this year, and I learned it actually from Claire, is that um, is about fertilizing. You know, if you want to actually grow and be productive, it's really, you really have to fertilize your plants, you know. Um, and what I do is, um, the two fertilizers that I use are the, um, the fish fertilizer, which I get Alaska fish fertilizer from nice. Mars, uh, or and the Hasta Grow. And so basically they're both liquid feed fertilizers, which is a lot easier on your plants because it has a lot less tendency to burn your plants. And basically once a week or sometimes twice a week, if you're really trying to get things to grow, you mix them up with, you know, you mix about a, a, an eighth of a cup into your two gallon watering thing. Uh, and fill it with water, and then you basically go around and you water everything with the fertilizer water. And if you do that once a week, it makes a huge difference in your productivity, in your growth, in the happiness of your garden. Because, you know, soil gets tired. You know, even though you put lots of organic matter and you try to build up your soil, the more soil grow things, the tired it gets, you know. And this is why you know, you want to do what you want to rotate, which crops. I, soil. Soil. I, feel, I feel a lot of kinship with soil right now. You will begin yeah. to love dirt so much more than you ever thought possible when exactly. you garden. You're like. <laughs> so anyway, what you're doing is you're basically giving 
nutrients back into the soil on a weekly basis, you know, and it's just like you, if you feed your body, you get good things from it. <laughs> and you actually you do it way more than I do. Like I, I, every, like once a month I'll remember and be like, oh yeah, I need to fertilize. Gosh. And then I'll kind of you know, I've just made it a day. Basically, I have a day that I go around and I fertilize everything first, and then I spray everything with BT. And that just it makes a huge, huge difference. BT is especially important in the fall and the winter because you're going to get all those little army worms. They love those and cabbage loopers and all the, the Texas bugs that love fall crops are susceptible to BT. So definitely use that. Um, the other thing that's been so great is if you struggle with bugs and you need to learn, is this a good bug? Is this a bad bug? Mm -hmm. Get up and join some of the local gardening Facebook groups. Like there's an Austin Organic Gardening Facebook group that's fantastic. There's a Central Texas Vegetable Growers and a Central Texas Gardening Group. And you can basically go up on that Facebook group, take a picture of your bug and say, what is this? What do I have to do to stop it? And you'll get a flood of information. It's true. You know? When we had the, we, we've just recently had a big army worm invasion of Austin. We did too. Um, yeah. And uh, so like, there's all these posts about army worms and how you deal with them. And I got really lucky, you know, I only got a few because I have St. Augustine grass and apparently they don't like that. They like Bermuda grass. Um, but uh, yeah. My wall was crawling. Like our outdoor wall was crawling with those things. And I was out in the garden with my little, I have like a little, um, Oh my God. Prayer yeah. thing that I got from Home Depot that's like a pressurized thing. So it's quicker. You don't have to do that. Gardening shouldn't be, um, you can, you can garden cheaply. I don't want it to feel like there's the <laughs> threshold where you can't garden if you're not, if you don't have a bunch of money to spend. But I got this thing that makes spraying that BT and everything a lot easier. And I was out there with those army worms, like spraying. Them. <laughs> okay. Really Y'all, this has been, this has been great. I want to, I want to be conscious of our time and kind of wrap us up soon. So if, I know you've talked a little about what y'all are planning on planting soon. Um, if you were just, if you were starting out and you were just going to pick like two or three things to kind of, and you want it to be successful, you're going to be able to fertilize. You'll be able to give it some love, but you don't want to, you know, it's, it's not a super stress. What, what are your kind of go-tos that you're like, this is going to work in, in your fall, um, fall, winter garden world. One of my neighbors is singing and it's lovely. Um, <laughs> um, I would say if you're kind of new to gardening and you want to just get started, get yourself a little bed, trellis some peas up because peas are a lot easier to grow in the fall here in Texas. There's a better season and you'll utilize space better that way. So trellis up some peas and then plant yourself some lettuces. They grow quickly. You can um, kind of harvest from around the edges and keep it going. So you can okay. make yourself little salads. Go back on the lettuce thing. This yeah. is what I hear about lettuce and it terrifies me. It's going to bolt. I'm like, is it going to run away? Is it joining the circus? Where's my lettuce going? It's it does a cartwheel bolt. and bolts it's right on the bolt so. and You're never going to want to eat it and everything's going to be awful. What does this mean? When do I pick the lettuce? When do I know it's okay. salad time and not? So basically what bolting means is when you're starting to grow your lettuce, you'll see this, um, the lettuce will start to make this spike that becomes the flower. And that's called bolting. And typically, um, typically there's a lot of lettuces that bolt when it gets too hot, okay? So if you have a lot of heat and your lettuces start setting flowers to make seed, that's what's called bolting. It's much less common in the fall garden okay. because it doesn't get as hot. But once that happens, like you just, it's all over. You Some just people don't... say that, but you know, I eat, I eat bolted coriander all the time. I eat bolted arugula. I mean, yes, it tastes a little different. It gets a little more bitter or the a little more gets stronger. Yeah. Whatever um, the taste is, it gets stronger. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, there are also more heat resistant lettuces like arugula. Um, but in the fall, I think you're going to have a lot better luck than you did before. Spinach is also good to grow in the fall here. And that, um, doesn't bolt as quickly in the fall, in my experience. I mean, I don't know. So with the greens, you just want it to look like how like you want it to eat it, and then you take it and make dinner. Right. Yeah. Right. So That's when you see when you see leaves that are about the size of the leaves that you sometimes see in the grocery store, and it's a good That's time really to kind of pick them around. I, the edge. I cook very well. I cook a lot. I, just, I think Claire's got this terrified look in her eyes, like Lauren knows nothing about this. No, well, I mean, but it is a cool this thing. I'm always like, where, when do I pick this? When do I harvest this? And and it'll yeah. also say on your seed packet, 
how many days to maturity. So write, jot it down in your phone or write a little, keep a little journal is one of the best things I started doing. I knew when I planted something, I knew about when it would be ready to pick. Mm -hmm. And usually it's pretty accurate. Well, and the thing with lettuces and most greens actually is that when it's time to pick them, uh, I mean, when they start to grow, you don't have to go out there and pull the whole thing up. No. Yeah. You go out there and you take your scissors and you cut a few pieces of lettuce off and you throw it in your salad and it grows back, you know, and you can do this all season, you know, just go out, cut a few seeds. I have done this with green onions in a yeah. glass of water in my house. The green onions will just, you know, keep going. And you, I, there's a there's a term for it that's called cut and come again. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ever see a vegetable talked about as cut and come again, that's what they're talking about, is that you can harvest pretty much continuously. You know, things like chard, things like spinach, all of those things are things that you can harvest continuously over the season. Radishes oh. are also great to grow in the fall. They're good on your salad. And they grow um, fast. They're great roasted and they're fast. They grow within like 30 days. So they're great to grow with kids too. My garden has become a schoolyard for my children since they couldn't go anywhere um, <laughs> during COVID. And like planting seeds and watching them grow and uh, harvesting them has been also really great for them. And those quick growing things like lettuces and radishes are great for kids. Peas grow really fast. Um, I, I actually, I, I would plant beans also. Beans, because yeah. beans are something that you know you can plant. They, it grows fast. Um, I mean, you have to look and see whether you're getting a bush bean or a pole bean. A pole bean means it wants to climb up a pole. A bush means it, bean means it makes its own little bush. But I mean, beans will give you like a handful of beans every day, usually. Mm -hmm. And Very so true. you know you'll get a meal out of the garden almost every day if you plant a couple of bean bushes or poles. One of the other um, differences between beans, if you're planting pole beans, they sort of um, set fruit and or set vegetables and flower and, and um, they produce over time. Bush beans are one of those ones that will kind of set all of their beans all at once. So uh, if you're going to do bush beans, I recommend succession planting, which means like plant a couple of your bush beans one week, wait another week, plant a couple more bush beans, wait another week, plant a couple more. That way you're not getting, I mean, unless you want like bushels of beans all at once, um, it's good to just kind of plant a few radishes, wait a week, plant a few more, stuff mm -hmm. like that. And now we can sing the song from the Fantastics. Plant a radish, pick a radish. Pick a radish, pick a radish. Yeah. Is it? I'm getting I'm all the theater tie-ins. I, I should have started with that. We, we, yeah. <laughs> um, that was great. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here and sharing your knowledge with our community today. Um, I I am inspired. I am Gray and I are building the raised garden bed in the back, and we will oh, that's be letting you know how that goes. We uh, we 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 do have some successful flowers going, which we haven't had before. Our, our front mm -hmm. garden bed, we've done that, but we mm -hmm. um, really want to take this step. And I know a lot of people do. Um, do y'all have? I want to give y'all the last word for this, um, Claire? Anything you want to you want to close? Have fun, with? trial and error. You know, if you're feeling desperate about it, you're working too hard. Um, and it's it's sometimes hard. Me, you know, I'm a perfectionist and very type A, and uh, that was one of the big lessons from the garden uh, over the years has been like, this is not life or death. You, for you anyway, um, for the plant maybe. <laughs> <laughs> But experiment, have fun, be willing to lose a few things so that you can learn. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's what I learned this year is, you know, you're going to lose some plants. Just accustom yourself to it. It's not a disaster. You know, when you're starting, try to get things that are not real expensive. Don't go buy a $500 tree and put it in your yard and expect to grow it when you've never grown anything in your life, you know. Yeah. But, you know, if you plant a bunch of radishes um, and they die, you're out, you know, uh, three bucks for the seed packet or whatever. Not a big deal. Um, and uh, when I was first starting, uh, I find it much easier to start from transplants mm -hmm. um, rather than try to start from seed. Um, seed is something that it's much cheaper if you can plant from seed, but it takes a lot of babying. I mean, you have to keep those things wet when they're sprouting and you have to keep them wet when they're young. Um, so that's more of a time thing, right? You need to figure out how much time you can put in the garden. Um, and if you actually set a little point of time in every day where it's going to be your garden time, where you go out and walk it, 
and you just walk your garden every day and you squish bugs or you just do one little thing it makes a huge difference in, you know, being connected, figuring out what's going on, figuring out what needs to be harvested. You know, just having that daily connection to the garden makes a huge difference in how successful you are. Because if you leave something for a week and you've forgotten to water it or if you've gotten to, you know, pick the bugs off of it, in a week it can be devastated, right? If you're connecting with it every day and you say, oh man, I've got some aphids, okay, I'm going to spray something or, you know, oh, I've got, you know, looks like some weird fungus growing on here. I'm going to go and figure out what's going on there. If you're checking that, you know, regularly often, you'll just have a lot better success. And, um, and then I actually, I'm, I'm kind of the opposite when I, <laughs> I'm kind of hands off, but it's, it's by virtue of just my life. But, you know, I, I would say like, if, if you're stressed out about it, like if it feels like a chore, then you are not doing it right. Like you just, right. you know, like, I mean, when I do my connection, I take my morning tea out in the garden. Yeah, that's my meditation. And I just walk the garden and I just look at the flowers and I just enjoy it. And then, you know, maybe I'll do like one thing if I feel like doing one thing. And if I don't feel like doing one thing, I'll just say hi and then go back inside the house. <laughs> okay, well, that's that's beautiful. Um, I'm watching hummingbirds right now. Right? Of, course you are. of course you're watching hummingbirds right now. <laughs> um, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Claire and Jennifer and Deja mm -hmm. for being with us. Um, I hope I hope our community goes forth and feels a little more connected to to their gardens, to the natural world around us. Um, thanks, y'all. All right. Yeah, everyone, happy, so fun. Happy gardening, everyone. Happy gardening, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.